Greetings, friends. Wherever you are, from wherever you have come to be part of God's family today, welcome to worship. In person or online, we gather in the light of God's love and the hope that is offered to all the world in Jesus Christ, who is with us even now. Our call to worship draws from Psalm 130, which includes a cry for help in time of trouble and confirms that we may place our trust in God's faithfulness and love. As you are able, I would invite you to stand as we join responsibly in these verses as our call to worship. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. We continue in worship as we are led by Charles Dickerson and Abigail Whitman, who will be singing for us the hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. We will join in spirit and in humming along. <laughs> Please be seated, everyone. Falling short of our aspirations to be completely truthful, encouraging, and generous toward one another is a common human experience. Forgiveness and a fresh start may be found with God. We turn to God with the confidence of children who know they are deeply loved. We will join in reading aloud the prayer of confession and renewal and then share in some moments of sitting quietly together in God's presence. Merciful God, we hear your call to live in love as Christ loved us. Our ears perceive these words in our worship. Our minds know what they mean. Our hearts long to follow them. But we know that tomorrow we will be tempted to slip into the familiar life where we ourselves are at the center of our world and the needs we focus on are almost entirely our own. Strengthen our resolve to love as Christ loves, for it is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. We are raised with Christ Jesus to new life. 
We are free to live out God's love in the world. We are God's saints and members of one another. Amen. Let us greet one another. It is good to be back among you. Um, Tira and I had a safe trip back and forth across the country. Uh, successfully negotiated our way across the Canadian border and uh, accompanied by our daughter, Hannah, her husband, Daniel, and collectively our four dogs. Uh, we spent three weeks with them, um, which is longer than we have had with Hannah since probably her junior year of college, a long, long time ago. Um, we also spent time going back and forth to Toronto, where Tira's parents live, and were experiencing some uh, challenges. Um, in the week before we left, uh, her father uh, fell and injured his hand. Um, while Tira and Hannah were actually uh, there at the home, um, and that fall has made clear from the care that was required uh, after it and his continued recovery that there are some changes uh, coming in their living situation um, and that those should be unfolding over the next uh, few weeks. We are really glad that we were able to be there for that time and to share with them in trying to come to a new understanding of where the future lies. Um, it was, it turns out, very important for us to be there as well as uh, good and loving for all. We had not seen either of them for the previous uh, year and a half. So, like so many others, uh, kept at a distance from those we love, um, but we continue to find our way through these days, uh, showing respect and care for one another, uh, keeping each other as safe and healthy as we are able to be and as we want to be ourselves. Congratulations and thanks to our wonderful children's ministry team under the leadership of Deborah DeLuca uh, for the amazing week of Vacation Bible Camp, which finished on Friday. In the face of ever-changing circumstances, they provided a place where children could experience uh, joy and wonder and fun as they learned about God and grew in faith. Thanks to uh, Don and Martha Tuffley for the beautiful flowers this morning in celebration of their 69th wedding anniversary, which is happening this very month, and congratulations to the two of you. <laughs> Thanks as well to our youth whose Sierra Service Project experience this year took place right here on our own campus. Uh, next week they'll share some about their efforts and we will dedicate the labyrinth which they built and which will be available for us over many years to come. And now I'd like to invite the attention of the children to gather. This is a ring toss game. The goal is to, well, it's not a ring toss, it's a beanbag toss, come to think of it. <laughs> the goal is to get the beanbag to land in the basket. And the players can decide how far away they want to make it the rule. You have to like, and you could adjust by age. It could be like, okay, if you're two years old, you stand here, if you're like, seven years old, you stand here. 
Hmm. If you're Miss Deborah, you get to stand back here. And if you're me, you get to stand right here. <laughs> Want to try it? You can pick the, the, okay, good place. Yay. Excellent. Oop. Okay, well, that, that's, a, that's a win, I'd say. You got one in there. One more. Great. Now we'll give Miss Deborah a chance to see if she can make it from way back there. Wow, see, that's how she organized Vacation Bible Camp. Perfect score. Excellent. Way to go. Well, with uh, the, the beanbag toss game, it's pretty easy to tell if people are following the rules. Like, if you stood where you weren't supposed to stand or you yanked the basket away while someone else was trying to throw the beanbag, then everyone would see that you were breaking the rules. Other games are a little harder to tell if somebody's breaking the rules. Like, let's say we were going to play hide and seek, and I was going to be the one to seek, and I said, okay, I'm going to count to 50. I'll cover my eyes and count to 50. You run and hide. But if you turned around and started going away to hide, and I went like this so that I could see right through my fingers where you were going, that's breaking the rules, and it makes it less fun for you because I've seen where you went, so I have a head start when it comes to finding you. Or if I say I'm going to count to 50 and I only count to 20 and then jump up and start looking for you, then that's frustrating too. Games have rules because that's what makes them fun and fair. And as soon as anybody stops following the rules, that's pretty much the end of the fun. Our scripture passage today has some rules. Not just rules for games, but rules for life. And the rules are, tell the truth. If you get angry, make sure you don't hurt someone and try to resolve the issue with your anger by the end of the day. Don't steal things. Don't say mean things. Say encouraging things. Forgive each other instead of holding a grudge. And try to be guided in everything you do by love. So those are good rules and important rules. And I almost think that even more important than the rules are the reason behind the rules. Remember in a game, the game is only fun and fair if everybody's following the rules. And it's similar in life in that we really are living our best life when we follow the rules that God has given us through Scripture. And the thing is, we can increase our desire to follow the rules by knowing the reasons behind them. So the reasons for the rules include we want to keep our good connections with other people, so that's why we always tell the truth. We want to make good decisions, so that's why we make a point to not act out of impulse of anger. We want to be people that help, not people that hurt. And so that's why we do our own work and we don't steal from others. We want to share the grace of God with other people. And so that's why we speak to them with patience and with kindness. We forgive others because God's been generous in forgiving us. And we love others because God loves us. So if we think that we might need a little bit of extra help, strength to follow those good rules, we always have the wonderful option of asking God for help. So let's say a prayer together. Dear God, make us truthful, respectful, generous, friendly, merciful, and loving. You are good to us, and so we want to be good to and for others. We pray in the name of Jesus as we also say our Vacation Bible Camp prayer. God in heaven, hear our prayer. Keep us in thy loving care. Be our guide in all we do. Bless all those who love us too. Amen. Have fun together in Sunday school.
one of the ways that we are given the opportunity to be more like Jesus is in sharing the gift of prayer, something in which he was found over and over again during his ministry and into which he instructed his disciples. Our prayers as theirs include care and concern for one another and for the world God made and loves. And so among our joys and concerns, needs and hopes that are gathering us today, um, Phil, Phyllis and Joe Sherwood invite our prayers for uh, their nephew, Chip Fowler, who has some health challenges of his own and who is caregiving for another. Um, Catherine's friend, Susie, is caring for her brother, Jim. Um, our prayers are with Alma Martinez's family as they gather on Wednesday for a memorial service for her. For the Ray Martin family, who will be gathering for a memorial at the Martin family home this afternoon. For the Rita Guyton family, who will be gathering tomorrow at Green Hills for a service of interment for her. And for um, the Sturgis family, as uh, they gather next Saturday to remember and to give thanks for the life of Bob. Um, these all were joined this morning um, with the news that uh, Sue Ellen Fung's godmother, Happy Chen, uh, passed away early this day. And so the family uh, will be gathering there um, uh, in, in uh, Singapore, but uh, Sue Ellen will not be able to go for, uh, I think, likely obvious reasons. Um, and those relationships uh, seem especially keen and important when we are at a geographical distance and, and so our love and prayers surround them in this time. We've also had a request to uh, pray for, I believe it is John John, that he may find strength to find peace and happiness and to know that he is loved by God and by many. With these and other hopes that are known to us and to others, uh, we invite you to bring those in prayer and to join those with that which is lifted up here in our sanctuary. O oh God of grace and mercy, we give you thanks that you have called us together to be your people and given us a world in which to serve. You share with us encouragement to live with one another in peace and offer us the example of Jesus as a model for us to follow. Whether we are stirred to anger by the actions of others or speak in ways that hurt each other, you offer forgiveness for all the ways we fail to live up to your hopes. In Christ, you gave us your very self that we might receive the gifts of new life and hope we need each day. As you reach out to the world in love, we remember brothers and sisters in other lands whose lives are threatened by forces beyond their immediate control. We lift up persons fighting fires here in California, in British Columbia, in Greece, and in Russia. Winds and dry heat have brought destruction to communities not far from us and ranged across the landscape near where the Olympic Games were born. We pray this day for the people of Afghanistan where fighting between government forces and the Taliban continues and where peace seems far off. We pray for peace as well between the people of Israel and Gaza, asking that you bring wisdom and courage to those working to end the violence between them. God of life, we lift prayers as well for members and friends of this community of faith who are ill or troubled who may be unable to gather with us this day. We pray for Chip Fowler, for John John, 
for Catherine's friend Susie caring for her brother Jim, for Orville Endicott, for Dennis, for Andy, for Diane, for Jake, Kathy, Steve, and Mary, for Bill, for Hal, Pauline, and Kim, as well as for others we name before you now in the silence of our hearts. Uphold all these in their desire for health and strength and bring comfort in the midst of anxiousness and fear. We pray for the family of Happy Chen and the family of Alma Martinez and for all who have received encouragement and hope from their examples of faithfulness and compassion throughout their lives. Gracious God, in Jesus Christ, you invite us to live in generosity and compassion, to follow the example of self-giving love that he offers. Draw us to yourself out of whatever might hold us back from being our best, and show us how to walk in your ways. This we ask in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We give to Christ's ministry through the church by various means, including direct transfer initiated by text message, or via rhumc.org, checks sent in the mail and contributing in person at the church office during the week or to the sanctuary offering plates on Sunday. We dedicate our offerings with this prayer. Eternal God, you call us to live our lives in imitation of you. Through these gifts, we dedicate to your purposes. Empower us to become the beautiful community you desire for your church to be. Our hope is to share your love with the world. Amen. You may be seated, but you already are, so. <laughs> if you are ever looking for instruction on how to live as followers of Jesus, the fourth chapter of Ephesians is a good place to look. We can find there a clear awareness of how easy it is to be angry, 
argumentative, critical, and self-centered. We also find reason and motivation to model ourselves after the example of Christ by being kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving toward one another. Our scripture reading for today is Ephesians 4, 25 through 5, verse 2, instead of 3. The bulletin says 3, but it's verse 2. So then, putting away falsehood, let us all speak, all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and the slander, together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us, and give, gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Thus ends the reading of the word. If you want to get a group of people in an uproar, introduce a referee into their gathering. Was the ball on the line or over the line? It's the referee's call. If you don't agree with the decision, you can file an official appeal. You could even appeal the appeal. And then your beach volleyball game will quickly devolve into chaos and controversy. Did that one player kick that other player? The referee should know, but no foul was called. If you think that's the wrong decision, you can appeal. The game will stop. The video recording will be consulted. And then it might turn out that there was a foul after all, and a penalty kick will be awarded. One soccer team will be thrilled. The other will be outraged and distraught. Some things I have always appreciated about competitive swimming are that, A, once you're in the water, you cannot fall down. And B, there is a lane line separating you and the other swimmers, so you do not have to worry about physical contact of either the unintentional or the deliberate variety. Also, in this age of electronic touchpads, the determination of the outcome of the race <clears throat> is completely objective. The fastest time denotes the winner. Of course, this does not mean that there is no cheating in swimming. The existence of steroids keeps that door open. But at least there are no screaming matches on the pool deck over the quality of the referee's eyesight or the legitimacy of the punishment that the referee applies. The scripture text that was just presented to us contains some direct talk about how we are to conduct ourselves as followers of Christ Jesus. The writer invites us listeners to join in speaking the truth and then shifts into what we might call command mode. Be angry, but do not sin. Thieves must give up stealing. Make sure the things you say do not cause harm. Do not cause grief to God's spirit. Get far away from bitterness and wrath, wrangling and slander. Be kind. It would be fair to call this a collection of rules for the new life, as our Bible editors did when they gave a title to this section of Ephesians. The rules are good ones and probably also hard to follow, since so many of them have to do with what we say and how we talk to people. So what's especially interesting to me is that there is no mention of a referee. The letter does not say, here are the rules for Christian living, 
and here is how we are going to enforce them. Rather, it says, here are the rules for Christian living, and here is why you will want to follow them. Focusing on the personal and communal motivation to pursue the standard voluntarily is the choice here, rather than a threat of consequences for failing to comply. It seems that in God's house, within God's family, among the followers of Christ Jesus, the preference is for people to choose to follow the rules, which could also be called the loving habits, because we embrace the reason behind the rules. The reasons to adopt the rules for the new life as our own, our motivations as given in Ephesians chapter 4 include the realization that we belong to one another and that anything we do to someone else we're actually also doing to ourselves. Second, a desire to have something to freely share with those who are in need. Third, the hope that our words may be a source of grace and peace to others. Fourth, the sense of gratitude for God's goodness and God's loving kindness and forgiveness towards us. Five, the understanding that we are deeply loved by Christ Jesus and that there is no greater model than the one he offers for human life on this earth. New life in Christ draws us in and makes us want to live by its rules because it is such a wonderful and beneficial way of life, both for us and for the world. Of course, this is not always obvious on the face of things. The beloved priest, teacher, and illuminator of the Christian spiritual journey, Henry Nouwen, wrote a number of books between 1969 and his death in 1996, in which he shared very specific struggles in the arena of living as God would have us live. Henry was trained both in theology and in psychology, and he was frequently willing to use his own experience as an example, even if the stories did not necessarily paint him in a positive light. Here is one story from Henry which suggests some possibilities for what it might mean to live according to the guidelines that we find in Ephesians chapter 4. Henry had gone to visit a man who revealed himself rather quickly to be a very unhappy person. The subjects of conversation raised by this man were as follows. The weather is terrible. My colleague has done me a grave injustice. My friend has not called or written in more than two months. My neighbor keeps me awake every afternoon when I try to take a nap. The government is corrupt. There's war and starvation everywhere. The world is falling apart, and you can't even count on the media outlets to tell the whole truth. As the man's aggravation and anger boiled over with increasing force, Henry wanted to offer a different perspective. Look, he was inclined to say, you have a nice house. You have enough money to keep you secure for the rest of your life. You have good friends and good neighbors, and you have time to travel far and wide. You could do so much good for so many people. Instead, Henry remained silent. The rage in the room overwhelmed him, and he went away. When he got home, Henry realized that he was shaking. So he lay down on his bed, took some deep breaths, and asked God to give him understanding. And as he lay there in the quiet and stillness of prayer, he began to get a picture in his mind of the man he had visited. And in this picture, the man was struggling down a road while dragging a heavy load along behind him. The load was so heavy that it took tremendous effort to move forward. The man had to stop often. Sometimes he almost lost his balance. Henry perceived that this heavy burden symbolized 
all the people and all the situations which had angered the man over the course of his life, the man was still angry at all those people and all those things. And so he was dragging this heavy weight along with him. Henry was impressed with the truth of this picture. And then he heard a voice saying, you are that man. No, protested Henry. I do not want a burden like that. I could not be carrying such a load. But as self-awareness dawned, Henry began to ask himself some questions. Who would I be without my anger, he wondered. Who would I be without anyone to judge or condemn? Who would I be without complaints, without feelings of rejection, or even without enemies? Henry realized that he was being offered an opportunity to let go of old wounds and old angers. The inner voice of love, which Henry had learned to identify as the voice of God, was saying, free yourself from your burden. Do not be afraid. Let Christ cut the chains. Let go. Without those judgments or those condemnations that you've been carrying around and now choose to release, you will still be what you are now and always have been, a child who is infinitely loved. Your vulnerability will be covered with love. The sun will go down not on your anger, but on your gratitude. With this profound transformation underway within him, the next day, Henry went back to see the resentful, angry man once more. Something about him looked different. The conversation began. Thank you for coming to visit me yesterday. Thank you for that visit, said the man. It was a good visit. Henry's first instinct was, reply, was to reply, I never said a word. You complained vigorously the whole time. Instead, Henry caught himself and he commented, I'm glad you feel good about my visit. Thank you for telling me that. You look much better today. The man smiled and sat quietly for a while. Then he began to speak. After you left yesterday, I said to myself, there must be more to me than my anger. Otherwise, Henry would not have visited me. I felt thankful, and I began to wait for you to return. Somehow, I knew that you would come back, and here you are. Thank you. It's good to be here with you, said Henry. The two men reached toward each other and clasped hands. We must stay in touch with each other, said the man being visited. Truly, replied Henry, we cannot live without each other. This story illustrates what the writer of Ephesians contends, that we are connected to each other, that our salvation is linked with that of our neighbor. Perhaps you noticed that Henry ended up in the same place as the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians with the conclusion that we are God's beloved children, able to live in love because we are loved, able to grow in Christ's way of life because Christ is near at hand to be our model. Young children, after all, have as a defining characteristic that they imitate those who raise them and care for them. They imitate our speech, our vocabulary, our mannerisms, our movements, our actions. Older children imitate a wider circle of those they admire, as well as those who have a large presence in their lives. If you ever need to be reminded of the power of role models so as to grasp how actions and attitudes can be shaped by imitating God, I encourage you to volunteer at Vacation Bible Camp. Vacation Bible Camp is staffed in significant measure by middle school 
and high school youth who were once campers themselves. Our camp is for preschoolers through fifth graders. And so positive are these youth memories of the fun and the excitement, the unity and the energy, the friendship and the delight of VBC that they dedicate a week of their summer every year, not for pay, but for joy, to continue the experience for a new generation of kids. These youth go all in to help the campers experience the theme, which this year came from Ephesians chapter 6, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of God's power. The youth do not just stand back and tell the elementary and uh, preschool aged children what to do. They lead the way by dancing along with the songs, learning the sign language hand motions, memorizing the scripture verses, playing the games and doing the experiments right along with their young charges. The youth counselors make the message come alive by wearing special costumes and by using encouraging prompts that match the theme, such as this year, Onward, knights, let's go forth on our quest. Today we're searching for the belt of truth or the shoes of peace or the shield of faith. Sam wore a knight's outfit all morning for five days, even though it inevitably made him totally sweaty. McKenna wore a princess crown and changed the color of her fairy wings every day. Cody had a different and highly unusual hat for each day from Monday through Friday. The shark with the wide open jaws and the googly eyed frog were the two that made the biggest impression on me. The volunteer staff even wore pajamas on pajama day so as to join the children in support of the mission project that we had going on. It is amazing to witness how the children are inspired in this environment as they are shepherded from activity to activity by the caring and attentive youth. The campers can hardly wait for next year's VBC, and as the years go by, they begin to look forward to becoming counselors themselves. In God's household, among God's people, we have the opportunity to be imitators of God and thereby become representatives of God's great love in a way that others may then be motivated to emulate. If that is not reason enough to voluntarily adopt wise and generous rules for daily living, I don't know what would be. There really is no higher calling. And I think it might feel pretty good to be able to get along with one another in love without having to rely on referees. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning really is a prayer. Chuck and Abby and Althea will lead us. Shall we stand?
We'll continue our practice of exiting through the side doors and gathering on the patio for those who would like to visit with one another. You'll be passing the offering plate on your way by in case you've been wondering what became of that opportunity. It is, is still available. And so now we go forth confident of the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the compassion and wisdom of the Holy Spirit within us. We go in God's peace. Amen. Thank you.